Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about Pokemon Go, and we're going to talk about uh, where the game came from and how you scaled up so so uh, so quickly. Okay. But I thought maybe we could start off just by I'm, I, I think I'm probably not the only person who might be interested to know this. How many Pokemon you have personally uh, added to your Pokedex? I honestly don't know. Don't I have, know? I have no idea. <laughs> Are you close to catching them all? <clears throat> no. I've gotten probably 70% of the way there. It's not bad. That's oh. not bad. It's a lot farther than I, I've gotten. Um, Pokemon did seem like it came out of nowhere, but it does have kind of a, or Pokemon Go, it seems like it came out of nowhere, but it does have sort of a long history. I don't think most people realize that it was, that it started even before Google days. Can you tell us, walk us back a little bit about the, to the origin story there? Sure. Um, so the two founders of Niantic, uh, John Hankey and myself, um, we started another company um, 17 years ago called Keyhole. Um, the outcome of that is today called Google Earth. And the idea there was to bring the Earth uh, to people's desktops. It's an opportunity to explore the world uh, from, your, from your desk. And from that, you know, we, we were able to build maps, add imagery to maps, um, and we gained a pretty good understanding of the world. Um, and that's, that's the genesis of map making for John and I. Um, so we took it to Niantic uh, with a, the goal of taking people outside. Yeah, how, how did you go from the idea of like we've got you know, all this map data to applying it to a game? Um, well, you first started out with uh, uh, John and I have kids about the same age. And coming home in the end of the day and watching our kids sitting on a couch playing a video game was rather uninspiring to us. Um, considering uh, us growing up, it was you know, run around the neighborhood, parents kicking you out of the house to go run around the neighborhood. Um, and those were some of the great glory days of my youth. My kids are not getting to experience that. So we were trying to find a way that we could take the knowledge that we had about the world um, and apply that to games so we can get motivate kids and even adults uh, to get back out in the real world. I mean, that was, that was something that was interesting, I thought, the first time we talked, was that you, you said that the, the, one of the big goals for you was always to get people outside and interacting, is that right? Interacting yeah, yeah. with each I mean, other. Mission statement for Niantic is um, adventures on foot with others. And the goal there is to get people outside exploring their community, uh, their city, other cities, um, and doing it with their families, doing it with people that they just met on the street. Um, and that's kind of the heart of everything that we do. Has that happened? Have people done that? Yeah, Ingress is actually pretty phenomenal, which is our first game, um, at connecting people, sometimes across the, across the world. Uh, you know, there are pretty strong relationships between people living in San Francisco and a Russian missions, a missile silo operator in, uh, in Siberia. Um, there's actually a complete network of people that are dis dispersed all over the planet that actually interact to create really large projects, um, doing large, um, large activities in that game. It's uh, pretty phenomenal. And they have to work together, right? Like you they can't, do. You can't play the game without working nope. together. Is you that, have is to work together. I mean, if you're creating a link that's 3,000 kilometers long, yeah. you have to have, and you have to have this key from the, the destination in order to create that link. There, there is a, and you have to physically take that to a person on the source in order to create it. Then that's, that's something that a lot of coordination has to go into effect to make that happen. Yeah, so Ingress had been around for how long before Pokemon Go? Uh, we launched it in November 2012. So it's and did that, had it, when Pokemon Go like really exploded, I mean, it was, it was a cultural phenomenon like I don't think I've seen before. Everywhere I was going, I didn't see it. I we were, you know, <laughs> I would see people uh, looking down at their phones. We went out to, uh, we sent some reporters out to Times Square mm -hmm. and just had them count how many people <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking down at their phones, and then so they would stop and ask people, yeah. like, or, you know, what are you doing? And, and it, I forgot what the percentage was. It was a huge percentage of people were, at, were all out playing Pokemon Go at the same time. That had to be a taxing load on your, uh, on your back end. How did you prepare for that kind of viral success? So we went into um, building our server infrastructure uh, with an idea of, of optimizing cost, or reducing our cost, which, which leads to a high-performance design. Um, and we just, you know, the four engineers that worked on it, they pretty much worked their butts off for the you know, four weeks uh, during the huge launch window to pretty much find and isolate all the bottlenecks and get rid of them as quickly as possible. Um, the system was designed to scale to be this big, 
We just never expected it to get this big this fast, so we never tested it at that scale. Um, but had we done that, had we, had we expected to get to 50x so where we, where we thought we were going to be, we, we would have tested it that load and we would have not had any problems at launch. So, What was life like for you when that was going on? I didn't sleep much. I know a lot of people on the team didn't sleep much. We were sleeping on couches. Like This would have been bed for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, we were a pretty haggard bunch. Were you just like living with your laptop at this point? And yeah, I pretty much carried it everywhere, and the cell phone, so. Um, one of the things that I think that a lot of people, uh, or, there, or there are quite a lot of stories about, was, was Pokemon Go had this huge uptake, but then it seemed like it had a pretty big drop off. But is, is, that, is, that, is that a fair assessment? Um, I, the, the, there was a comment from an individual on our team, and, and uh, I think he put it most succinctly. It's like, we've gone from being a cultural phenomenon to a hit game. And today, the, the popularity of the game has, has waned from its uh, initial launch, um, but it's still performing incredibly well. And uh, it, I mean, I think John last month announced that we've got 65 million monthly active users How many? in the game. Sorry? 65 million. Jesus. So th there's still a lot of people playing this game today worldwide, and uh, that's still pretty phenomenal. I, it's not as big as it was when we launched, but it is still a pretty what, hip What was it at, at its peak? We haven't told anybody you that. You haven't no. told anybody that? No. You can tell people right now. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell no? you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did it also drive people back to the original game, back to Ingress? Yeah, we saw a halo effect. I mean, there's some people that came into the game, tried it out. Um, some people stuck. Um, it's, Ingress is a pretty complicated game. It requires a pretty elaborate social network. Um, but it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's significantly more complex than Pokemon Go. Um, and we did see some people come into it because of that. So the exposure was there. One of the things that I, I think uh, I encountered and other people encountered was, was like Ingress players telling me basically, like, they, like we talked before, it reminded me of like indie music fans who were sort of like, no, you got to go check out the first album. Um, did that original community, like, did they embrace all the, this, this new influx of people? How, how did they react to that? Yeah, they thought it was great. I mean, it's a lot of people coming into um, to the, the thing that they really love. I mean, the people that play Ingress today really love that game, and they've been playing it for four years. Yeah. Uh, we hired one of the guys, his, um, our security guy, who's a fanatic playing that game. I mean, every weekend he's, he's off doing some elaborate mission with a bunch of his friends, and it's, it's really inspiring to hear him tell his stories about the experiences he has playing that title. So one of the other things that I think uh, Pokemon Go did was it exposed a lot of people for the first time to AR, to all, you know, which has become suddenly kind of a buzzword this year in yeah. the Valley, probably largely due to you guys, or, or at least in part due to you guys. Uh, at F8 this year, there was a whole lot of emphasis on uh, AR. Yep. Um, there are certainly stories that there are other very large tech companies looking into, uh, looking into some AR things on the horizon. Mm -hmm. What is it about AR that, that is sort of like, that makes it hot now, that makes it possible now in a way that it wasn't previously? What is it that you think uh, these big companies find so interesting about it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to decorate somebody's face with a yeah. mustache or a beard. Um, for us, augmented reality offers the promise of enabling heads-up gameplay. Because um, if you can get people's heads out of their phones while they're playing games, then there's more social interaction. And since social is as much a part, you know, real world social interaction is as much a part of our DNA as, you know, getting out and exploring in the real world, um, finding a way to enable that type of experience for our players is really something that's, it's a strategic objective of ours. So, you know, as the technology evolves, we'll continue to use it and provide better and better experiences so that we can enable social, that's that social dynamic which really makes these games even more fun. Did you find there were ever any pitfalls in layering digital objects on the, uh, on the physical world? Um, for us? Well, we don't really layer anything. We just turned on the camera. Or, or, or well, <laughs> for, uh, you know, I mean, for example, like for creating uh, Pokestops or something like that, or, or, or Pokemon gyms or things like that, were there, were there ever any, any incidents with that where you, where you created something digitally that, you know, like, like suddenly your, uh, your, your place of business is a uh, Pokemon gym or something like that, or your church is a Pokemon gym. Were there, were there issues with that? Um, there were some, not very many. 
Um, most of it was uh, people actually leveraged it to their advantage. Uh, I remember seeing like an ice cream store in you know, just outside of you know, Seattle and the Washington Washington State um, that he he was a pokey stop, um, unbeknownst to him, and his business uh, went up fairly dramatically because of that. Um, and there were coffee shops I know in San Francisco that had pokey stops nearby. They put the little placards out saying, "If you're a Pokemon player, level five or above, come in, show us your game, and we'll give you a two dollar coupon for." something in the store. So people were using it to their advantage. There wasn't a, we didn't see a whole lot of problems with, with other things. Did you, have, uh, did you have people asking if they could become gyms or oh, stops yeah. or things like that? How did, yeah. how did you handle those requests? Um, very carefully. <laughs> I think we, uh, we, we don't want to like, cover the world with, with Pokestops and gyms. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to balance, we're trying to balance gameplay by putting Pokestops uh, evenly distributed around the world. Uh, we also have a sponsorship model for our game. Um, if you've noticed, Starbucks are, are Pokestops in our games. They're, they're a sponsor for the application. Um, so people are actually paying us money in order to populate the world with Pokestops. Um, in some cases, we, you know, we, we've responded to community requests to take down Pokestops that were either inappropriate or um, People didn't want them there. We're adding new features to the game so we can put um, kind of operating hours. You know, parks have, have hours that they tend to operate from like 6 a.m. to sunset. Uh, we're putting operating hours around those to prevent people from being in the parks after hours to remove that lure. So there's, there's things that we're doing in the game to sort of get people to do the right thing while they're playing the game and still have a good time. It kind of that brings up an interesting question to me. I always wondered why there are so many stops in parks and places like that, and beaches. Like, like, like I live at, I live in Ocean Beach in San Francisco, and there were, and, and I live right by Golden Gate Park, and there were, it was just filled with stops. Was that done intentionally? So the the way that we got most of the content for Pokey Stops um, was a photo submission system built into Ingress. Um, so these are community provided photos. Uh, we had. We had a team of individuals who actually rated those and determined whether or not they should be part of the game. Uh, so we have a database now of several million of these things that are all over the world. But it's, it's largely a, the, the individual who took the photo that thought that that was something interesting that they wanted to share with the rest of the world and providing that to us so that we can build it into the game. Gotcha. So like if I took a picture in the park of a statue or something like that, added it to Ingress, it showed up as a Pokemon yeah. stop? Is it would eventually show up as a Poke stop in the game. Gotcha. OK, interesting. That's, I, I always assumed that, there were, that there were, this was part of the outdoor element that you guys were trying to get people out walking around in, but that's not the case. Um, with Ingress, we started with a, with a data set came from a product called Panoramio that was largely of outdoor artworks. And that was kind of what we wanted to be the heart of this, because uh, for us, the genesis of that idea was you know, walking around Google, there's hundreds of sculptures and it wasn't until we actually built them into Ingress that we realized that these sculptures actually existed, and we, we actually stopped and looked at them. Um, and that was, was a little bit of discovery, a little bit of, um, of uh, that aha moment that, um, that we really wanted to take advantage of. So we picked those things that most people walk by every day that they don't typically pay attention to, and let's pull it front and center so that people can get a better idea for what's around them. That's interesting. Did you, were, were, there, were the stops like evenly distributed in smaller towns and things as well as the big cities? Like if you're in a small town that maybe didn't have a, a, a mural or a statue, how did, how, did, how did you help those people play Pokemon Go? Um, we still have some challenges in um, rural areas um, and some suburban areas. Uh, but again, it's, it's largely um, crowdsourced content. Um, we're building systems today that will allow us to process um, photos from those areas much more quickly. Uh, we actually stopped after we spun out because we didn't have the resources to man a team to actually process the new photo submissions. Um, but we built a new system that will enable us to do that um, going forward, which is a little more cost effective. And what, with a little bit of time we have left, can you talk about what's next for Pokemon Go? Um, today's version of Pokemon Go um, doesn't have cooperative gameplay really built into it. So this that's is the Ingress feature, basically, yeah? Um, not quite. I mean, it'll look different. 
but the features that we'll, we'll have later this year will be cooperative gameplay, um, a more social dynamic type of gameplay. And those will come out later this year. Um, and then we've got other titles in the works as well. But those will show up a little bit later. And how many people, I'm just curious, have now actually completed the Pokedex and caught them all? I remember when the first guy did, it happened like, I don't surprisingly have that statistic. quickly. <laughs> I guess I could uh, ask some of our data guys to figure that out, but I, I really don't know. Is it a handful, though, or, is, or are, there, are there a lot? It's, it's difficult because we don't have trading in the game. So in order to fill the entire Pokedex, um, you have to travel around the world in order like to get to the to, Do you have to go to every continent? You would have to go to most. Africa is the only one that we don't have a specific Pokemon in. Um, and I think um, some significant parts of Asia don't have it either. So I think Australia, Japan, Europe, the United States, um, and Latin America. So, I mean, my wife is pretty close. She's, how, how far off is she? I think she's got 20 left in the North Jesus American Pokedex. Christ. So Amazing. She's, she's pretty far along. That's cool. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate sure. it. Feel good talking to you. Yeah. Good talking to you. Thanks, guys.